You are listening to the Techie Leadership Show with Bogdan and Andrei. Hello and welcome to the Techie Leadership Show. Today with me, I have my co-host Bogdan Hello. and uh, the amazing Peter Leeson. He is an amazing person. And uh, Peter does change management and helps companies go through change management, which is not easy and requires support and guidance at every level. Through independent, confidential, and honest investigation, he develops and leads change management initiatives to success. His holistic approach to continuous improvement and quality management assists you in squaring the circle of improving quality while reducing cost and effort. Hi, Peter. And welcome to the show. Hello, Andre. Hello, Bogdan. Hello. Thank you. you Thank you for inviting. Thank you for inviting me. I am very. No, it's our pleasure to have you. It's our pleasure to have you. Uh, do you want to add something more to my introduction? Um, no. I, I, let me give you a bit of my past. Um, give you a bit of okay. my history. So, a, a, a long time ago. 40 some years ago I started off as a cartoonist cartoonist yes well I'm learning to doodle now <laughs> so it's interesting yes I published I published some comic strips in Belgium at the time um, then I got very hungry and looked around <laughs> starving artist looked around to try and find a good job and decided that computer programming was something a lot of people were looking for. So I could do that and continue my cartoons on the side. Um, as any computer person knows, programming is not something you do part time. It starts taking up your mind 24 hours a day. And so very quickly that became the full-time job. It allowed me to um, move and go and work for a number of large companies. I was responsible for financial software for Levi's, the blue jeans people uh, across Europe. I um, joined a French company and went to live in Grenoble as part of a research and development team, which then sent me to Pittsburgh in the USA. While I was in Pittsburgh working as a project manager, team leader in research and development, I got headhunted by some people from Carnegie Mellon University who wanted to start up the business of process improvement in Europe and send me back to Europe. And so I started off my consultancy career as a process auditor. And that is a term I hate, but that is what I was. I would come into a business with my book. If you're doing what my book says, you're right. If you don't do what my book says, you're wrong. And (laughs) I soon realized this wasn't helping and I went into process consultancy and started to explain to people why this was important and why this was the way to do things and what were the consequences of not doing it. From that, I realized that process is only a tool. The objective is quality. Quality is what distinguishes you from everybody else and started working really on the quality and saying all the rest is just tools, communication, uh, electronics, whatever it is, it's just a tool which you need to bend and adapt to your needs. So true. And then slowly moved on to realize that the reason quality was not happening was not because of any of these tools. It was mostly a question of culture. And so I moved on into trying to help change the culture of organizations throughout the whole company by basically establishing trust from management down to every level in the company 
agreement on what was important and what mattered and a focus on doing the right thing. So I defined culture as the way your employees behave when management isn't watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's so, a really good definition. And it's so true. That's, it, that's when you see culture in a company. Yes. And no management is around. Yeah. And do, do the people still support the company when they're not around? And that's why, as you said earlier on, I tried to conduct one-on-one um, -on -one interviews with people within the company which are completely confidential. I want to know what annoys you, what frustrates you, what pleases you, what helps you, what's blocking you, and so on. Just, it's an open discussion Every topic is interesting, nothing is off bounds, nothing is secret. And from that I can understand the gap between general people's thoughts and management's thoughts. Trying to talk to as many people as possible so that your specific problems as an individual, the fact that you don't like your boss, that's your problem. If I find out that uh, 20 or 30 percent or more of the staff don't like the boss, then we have a serious problem which I need to report. Yes. Um, well, that's that's like a good idea. If you want to find out if you're um, as the boss or the manager, the leader of a team or of a company, if you want to find out how good is your culture, take a vacation. And see exactly what happens while you're away and, and relaxing and if everything goes okay uh, according to plan and probably have a good culture if it doesn't well better work on it and ask peter for some help <laughs> <laughs> okay peter uh let's uh, with with what do you want to start do you, some people like to start with the the, the failure story or some people like to start with the success story related to leadership, uh, what would be your cup of tea? Let me start with a good failure story. Great. Um, okay. <laughs> I run my own business for 13 years, 12 years, 13 years. And nice. one day I decided I was tired of spending all my evenings and weekends doing tax reports and marketing and all this other stuff you have to do when you own a company, when you're trying to run a business. Yes. And so I decided to close the business and find myself a real job, a normal job. Okay. And I found the ideal job. It was 15 minutes drive from my home. It was as quality... Cool quality manager in a um, international software company and it sounded absolutely perfect wow. <laughs> except I'm a consultant I'm a good consultant I'm not an employee I was a bad employee one okay. of the good first job. things I found out was that as a consultant, management would pay me to find out what is wrong in their business and what needs to change at any level. Okay. As an employee, you don't tell managers what they're doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and is I'm that very, good or not? <sighs> it's not good. I think managers in general need to be more open um, yeah. If anyone, if you are a manager and people bring you bad news and problems and risks and complaints, that's good. That's because they believe you can do something about it. If they only ever give you the good news, you're in trouble. Okay, so what happened? Um, moved on from trying to change things the way things were going on. I changed a few things. I put in place a few practices that helped. Um, but I very quickly got blocked every step of the way. So mm -hmm. they wanted to improve the quality. They did not want to uh, for me to touch their process. They did not want me to organize training sessions. 
Um, I got told off when I presented metrics regarding customer complaints because that was somebody else's measurements, no. not mine, that had nothing to do. Um, so I, I just got blocked every step of the way. I was asked, we, we had a, a major client, it's an international company, who everybody knows, and they were in the process of closing their contract with this business. And the reason they were closing was because the product was so bad. They were getting okay. two, three, four releases per day each one solving one defect and creating two or three additional defects. Oh. <laughs> I was asked to do a root cause analysis as to what went wrong. I did that. I traveled around and met senior management from this multinational and talked to them about what happened, what went down and so on. Interviewed all kinds of people on the team and produced a fair report. The report said, we the suppliers did this wrong, you the customers did that wrong, we reacted this way, you reacted that way, and it was a balanced report which said, you know, the relationship is failing, not because of yeah. us, not because of you, but because of a whole series of things on both sides. That was not acceptable. <laughs> the client got oh, a copy of the report. Senior management went ballistic, went furious, because I should not have told them that we had made anything, any mistakes. We, I had to, oh. in my root cause analysis, prove it was entirely the customer's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you should have written it all, chopped it in two, and sent just the half with, with the client's faults. Oh so this lasted for a while. Then finally the job came down to backdating and falsifying documentation to fool the auditor. Oh. And that was the end of it. I couldn't yeah. do that. So I tried to start up again as a freelance consultant. Which I, is dif I, difficult because I build up my business. I failed at every marketing and advertising campaign I tried. I build up my business entirely through word of mouth reputation. People seeing what I did, changing companies, telling them what I did and so on. And over the three years that I was working for this other business, I lost all my clients because they yeah. were going somewhere else and it's not easy to build up a word of mouth reputation from scratch. Yes, yeah. uh, I guess it's not. And uh, your story, like, I also empathize with your story because several times I've been brought into companies, hired to be a um, change agent, uh, to bring new ideas and that's how the job was pitched to me. We're going to come in where you have to, sh we want to have to do changes, ship shape, make it better, grow, expand. We, and yes, we're going to, we, we want to work with you. And the first day I got there, basically they tied both my hands behind my back and said, look, if you, if you still manage to do any changes with both your hands tied around, uh, around at your back, we'll tie your legs also. Yes. And, uh, and then we'll gag you. <laughs> exactly. And then we'll send you to work remote from another office space. Yeah, so it's, they always tell you like, we want change, but do not rock the boat. Uh, and if you start even a little rocking of the boat, you become really unpopular really fast with, with <laughs> most of the managers funny enough the 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 frontline people the 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 people that deliver the products or work on them they want the change they want to see progress inside the company usually management is the side that doesn't want the the progress because they're comfortable in their mm -hmm. routines they have the same known problems uh, their problems but they know them 
so they're comfortable also. Uh, it's it's something yes. that uh, I cannot wrap my head <laughs> around easily. The managers don't want you to rock the boat. The people doing the work know that the boat is sinking. Yes. So, um, I, I question for very you. much believe in turning over the boat and <laughs> challenging, challenging your basic principles and saying, all right, as a business, what do you stand for? What is important? What do you value? And if you say you value quality and customer service and so on, then you need to do that and everything needs to be focused on that and you need to be able to prove it and demonstrate it. But mostly we don't because we're too busy firefighting. Yes. Yeah. Peter, do you find that there is um, a high level of bureaucracy in the private sector as high as in the public sector since you work with so many international companies? Uh, Bureaucracy is a much maligned word. Um, bureaucracy, bureaucracy is not necessarily negative. So the idea behind bureaucracy is to make sure that your customers receive the same level of service, no matter who is delivering it. So if mm -hmm. you don't have okay. bureaucracy, you will have very good people and very bad people, and the bad people will destroy your reputation faster than the good people can build it up. So we put in place controls and standards and processes and procedures and uh -huh. end up with bureaucracy in order to make sure we are always delivering the same level of service. That is such a fresh perspective. Then things start going wrong because the problems which you were solving that you put in place these controls for no longer exist, but the controls still exist. And yeah. so the paperwork ends up just right creating reports rather than communicating. And that's when bureaucracy starts going wrong and starts breaking down and slowing people down. And if you go into a large company, you will find a lot of bureaucracy. So if you go, um, especially An absolute, uh, bureaucracy, yes, if especially if you go into companies like, um, take a, a random company, if you go into General Motors, you will have a lot of bureaucracy because it's a very large company and they need to make yes. sure everything is working correctly all the time. If you go yeah. into a more dynamic organization, things change continuously. And for most managers, that's very uncomfortable. This is where Toyota beat everybody else because they killed off the bureaucracy if it wasn't helping the workers. They put in place this famous system where every worker in the factory could stop the whole factory if they saw something going wrong. And they killed off the whole bureaucracy system by requesting that you confirm this is producing value for you and is not just additional work. Yeah. Does that make sense it, to you? Yeah. Does that yeah, answer your question, Bogdan? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Yes, it actually does. And now shifting years, we heard about the, the leadership failure. What would be your biggest leadership success? Okay, I'm going to use a success story that I've used many times and which is my, 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 my first client in Romania. Okay. So this was a subsidiary of a Dutch company which was um, trying to improve things. And a friend of mine who was a Dutch consultant auditor was working with them, trying to make things happen. And he recommended they speak to me to okay. do an audit, give them the rubber stamp and tell them they're great. And I got hired to do it. I did it. I did the audit, the appraisal, and failed the company completely. 
Okay. Um, my Dutch colleague stopped working for them fairly soon after that. Not sure why. And they asked me to tell them how to do it correctly. What are the things that need a changing? I said, I cannot remain auditor if I'm providing you the solution, but I can provide you theoretical answers and do mini audits in order to identify that they're producing the results. Okay. Uh, we did that over a period of a few years. Um, at an international conference, if I remember correctly, was in Amsterdam. Two of the key people in this company came over from Romania and gave a talk as to how they had survived the 2008 credit crunch, um, doubled in size, number of employees, had the highest level of customer satisfaction that they had ever had, had the Whoa. lowest level of people leaving the company in the history of the company, and they said it was all because of me. Awesome. Amazing. And that is why I continue coming back to Romania on a regular basis to speak at conferences and to help various companies. Yes, I know. We've met at one. Yeah. Only one? Or two. <laughs> Who knows? I'm I'm waiting for the conference conference circuit to reopen so I get to meet you and other yeah. amazing people. Um, and if it, if you were to sum up like all, all your life knowledge about leadership, what would be like your leadership philosophy? If you look behind you and nobody's following, you're not a leader. Um, we often tend to confuse the words leaders and managers. A leader is someone who inspires you motivates you and who you want to follow. A manager is someone you have to obey. They are very different roles and you need the combination of both. But the leadership is inspiring people. It's uh, hiring people that are smarter and more capable than you are and motivating them to do their best and to continue stretching themselves every day. That yeah. would sum it up, basically. Yeah. The truth is that there are many leaders without titles. That's yes. Oh, yes. Leadership has nothing to do with your position in the company. You, you, can, you can inspire and motivate people at any position. You can make them want to be like you. I, I, I often think leaders, there's... Um, if you go into a room, a party, where a group of people, there is often one person who comes in and suddenly all the young people congregate around this one person. I don't know yeah. why. Something about this adult attracts young people and they relate to this adult. That's leadership. Yes, and you can see and even at conferences, some uh, some speakers they gather a crowd even after they talk. People want to engage with them, discuss, change ideas, just get just say hi and tell them how uh, they've influenced their lives, even if even if they're not working for for that person. So there are different levels of leadership, and it's a continuum on the spectrum and wherever you start it's okay but if you keep improving it's even better yes <laughs> okay now let's and move like to very often okay. very yeah. often in lots of companies the problem is someone came up with an idea as an entrepreneur created a business created a product starts growing and the entrepreneur remains a brilliant solitary figure who invents things and does everything and ends up not being able to lead the company or even to manage it. 
and that has killed off many companies. Well, it's easy to feel like this is your baby and try to control everything and micromanage everything, but which is fine. If you're successful. If you really want to control everything and micromanage everything, then you are not a manager. Hire a director, professional director or CEO and continue being the chief technical officer or something. But you have to decide, I need someone who can run the company for me and do all the other stuff. Yes, and you have to be able to work with that person. Yes. Usually it's hard if you have a, a person that's so involved all the time in the minutia of the business. Even if you bring someone to run, to oversee the grand vision and take it, take it there, mm -hmm. lots of sparks probably are going to fly. Yes. <laughs> okay. What would be the top three leadership tips you have for aspiring leaders? Listen to the people doing the work. Okay. Listen to the people under you. They know what's going wrong. They know what's happening. Encourage them to tell you what is going wrong. Encourage them to always be honest. We all make mistakes. Making mistakes is normal. It's natural. Hiding your mistake for me is the unforgivable sin. Yes. You may never hide your mistake. You have to share it, report it, explain what you've learned from it, why other people, how, how other people can avoid making a similar mistake. And if you feel you can talk to senior management and tell them you don't know what you're doing, you don't understand this, you can't respond, you, you've made a mess, then you've got leadership. If you cannot talk to your management about this, or if they don't listen, that's not leadership. What would be a good balance between uh, transparency, as you put it, and uh, diplomacy? Because you have to be honest and speak with people, but uh, the way you say it often affects the end result. Um, I worked for a few years for a French manager, um, senior manager, and I used to go up to him on a regular basis and say, I've seen this happening, this worries me, I think this is wrong, there's a risk here. And his response was always, you do your work, I'll do my work. I am the boss, I run the company, you go and do your stuff. But then I saw that he had he implemented something in response to what I said, so I thought I'll continue doing this. I don't mind if he tells me off every time, at least he hears what I'm saying. I then moved for to an American manager. I'm not typecasting here nationalities. I moved to an American manager and did the same thing, and his reaction was, that's very interesting, what do you suggest we do about it? Okay. And my first reaction was, no, no, no. I bring problems, you bring solutions. <laughs> but that was where the balance is between honesty and diplomacy. I think this is a problem. I think this is going wrong. And I think that maybe we should look at or consider doing this or change something. So... It's not criticizing, it's bringing solutions. And then you can be completely honest. If you're only criticizing, then you're in trouble. Yeah, so true. That, that's something that uh, I always told to my team members, look, if you have a problem, it's okay. Come to me with uh, the problem, but please also come with a solution. It doesn't have to be the right solution. But just have something. Don't use me like your personal Google to solve problems. Um, I, I want to see that you thought about it at, at least. It's not something yep. you had a thought and said, oh, I'm going to dump it on him and see if something happens or not. There has to be some, some mental work involved in it. And it's okay to say, 
I don't know what should be done about it. Ah, that's also that okay. is that is acceptable. Uh, it's saying, okay, I look, I've thought about it. I've got no solution. Uh, we need to talk. That's also good. Yeah, yeah. You, you see, like I investigated, yeah. I found this, this, and this. I don't think they're going to work. I have no idea what can be done, but this is the situation. That's also good. And um, now moving on, uh, a question that I really like to ask is what is the book that had the most profound impact on you? Okay, that's that's a challenge. So I'm going to take two books. Two books, two books, so it's okay. I'm going to take two books, one old one and one new one. The old book is, I think, one of the most important books in leadership and management that has ever been written, which is a okay. book written by... You have my attention now. <laughs> Written by Dr. <laughs> book written by Dr. Deming, which is called Out of the Crisis. Out of the and crisis. If I remember correctly, it was published in the early 1980s. It's not a difficult to read book. Um, it's a little bit messy. I think he's thrown in a lot of ideas and didn't necessarily build an architecture in his book to structure it correctly. But uh, he comes up with things that are typically going wrong in businesses, uh, how to solve them, and talking very much about the damage that uh, some activities do. So there's a quote that I've often seen used by Dr. Deming that says, in God we trust, everybody else bring data. But he also okay. said, you don't manage by measurement and by KPIs and by metrics, because that is building fear into people for miss, they're scared of missing their objectives and they learn to hide reality because they have to meet the measurement. You're asking me to provide you the measurements which you are going to use to decide if I get a raise at the end of the year or get fired or get a promotion, I can guarantee I can find you good measurements. <laughs> That's okay? true. So, so true. It's, it's, it's substitute leadership is his key word in there, right? Do it. Um, he is recognized as one of the key people behind the Toyota whole uh, continuous improvement, Kaizen approach and so on. And he's had an enormous amount of influence in the world in general. Um, most people have heard of his PDCA cycle, Plan, Do, Check, Act. That also comes from him. The second book I want to talk about um, is a recent book, which is called Rebel Ideas. Rebel Ideas. And the idea behind Rebel Ideas is that, and I've seen this so often, you hire people because they fit into the team, they understand, they work the same way, they have the culture of the team, they've got good team spirit and all this. And you're losing valuable information. So, for a long time, I disapproved of the concept of positive discrimination, where okay. you will hire a disabled person or a woman or a black person or whatever in order to build up your numbers and show that you've got um, varied workforce. And this book made me realize that I was wrong, that this is actually a good thing. Because someone who has been brought up in a completely different context, someone who has suffered discrimination in their life because of yeah. their gender, because of the color of their skin, because of anything else, will identify problems in what you're trying to do that you cannot see. They will see the, the risks, the troubles, the difficulties in what you're trying to do. Uh, 
We had an example a few years ago in, uh, in the UK, which is a very good illustration of this. We had a prime okay. minister who decided that if they catch someone who is spraying graffiti or destroying things, policemen can take them, bring them straight to a cash machine, and they have to take out and pay a hundred pounds immediately on the spot. Okay. It sounded like a good idea, except mm -hmm. most of the people who are doing damage at night don't have a hundred pounds and certainly don't have a bank card where they can get it out of a bank just like that. Okay. And that's why it doesn't then? work. And the problem is that people who become prime minister usually come from a comfortable background and have never really met poor people. They don't really understand what this means. They cannot relate. Yeah. They cannot relate and they just don't see where the problem is. Hundred pounds isn't that much money. Well, yes, it's a lot of money for the people who are most likely to be creating trouble. And that's where, that, that's what uh, Matthew Sayed in his book, uh, Rebel Ideas, talks about. Um, so that's S-Y-E-D. -E he talks about the fact bringing in these people, get people who have knowledge on the topic, but come from a different background. If everyone in your company has been to the same university and been taught by the same professor, you have got a very narrow knowledge of the subject, even though you have got 50 people who have the same narrow knowledge of the subject. Yes. It's good to bring uh, some people in to rock the status quo and rock the boat. Yes. Uh, just have to be able to build in your uh, culture mechanisms to handle all the little rocking and make it feel normal. So uh, let, let me give you an anecdote here. I was, I was, I said earlier, I worked in France, then I moved to the United States. And I was okay. developing the a system, designing a system that would allow a sales software to calculate the right tax no matter what you sold from any place to any place. So we oh, took on board oh, wow. <laughs> all the different tax systems that I could find. I read hundreds of books about how taxes what were calculated uh, and started building that all in. When I went to the States and met the team, I explained it to them. I showed them the, the concept. I laid it all out and then I said, now I want you to tear this down, tell me why it's wrong. And they were baffled by this. This wasn't in their culture. They said, you mean you want us to tell you why, that it's good? I said, no, I want you to tear it down <laughs> while it's just words on paper. Once it's developed, it's yeah. too expensive. It's too late. I need, yeah. Yes, I need you now while it's just a concept to shoot it down. Look for problems in it. L prove that it doesn't work. That's your number one activity before we develop anything. And that for me seemed a natural thing to do, but for them was very strange. Yeah. Uh, well, Peter, I really, really enjoyed all your stories. Where can people go to find out more about you? Um... Okay, let me see. Obviously, I'm on LinkedIn. Everybody's on LinkedIn. Um, I have got a website, which is orchestratedknowledge.com with a dash between orchestrated and knowledge. I've got a book called Orchestrated Knowledge. Um, I am giving a talk in a few weeks on the 9th of june that's awkward to tell people about this uh, which is on designing a culture for innovation so basically how do you change a culture build it up 
in order to get a more creative workforce. If you're not being creative, if you're not innovating, I believe you're putting yourself at risk to be replaced by robotics, artificial intelligence, and other things. So I want to create creative workforces, and that's what the talk is about. Um, Where is it held? Uh, it is held online, and let me just check if I, if you, if, if you go to the links, I want yes. to put them in the show notes it's, so people can go check it's, them out. It's organized it's by a group called Digital Leaders. I'll, I'll send you the link to that and you can put them okay. in the notes then, yes, as you say. Um, and you can always contact me. Of course, I then, highly recommend uh, you contact Peter, especially if uh, you want to implement some change inside your company or inside your team. Um, and as Peter told us, like through his stories, it's easier to have a consultant come in and do some changes for you because you can always blame it on the consultant. <laughs> Okay. And the consultant is allowed to tell your management what you may not say. Exactly. It offers you a level of insulation. Well, Peter, it has been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for being on, on uh, the show. Take care. Bye. Thank you. That was today's episode. Tune in daily. Rate, like, subscribe and share, please. Oh. You can find further info and materials in the show notes on techyleadership.com, including links to the guest book recommendations.